Olympics, uh, part of the uh, 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 founder organizing of uh, ICC, International Coronary Congress, and ISCAS, International Society of Coronary Artery Surgeons, we have decided to offer not only one annual meeting per year, but instead engaging the community of surgeons around the world who are interested in coronary surgery with a, a, a more uh, um, uh, broadcasted package every month uh, uh, with a lot of difficulties but we are trying to set up uh, live talks that are one hour over a weekend uh, a time in which we can discuss about specific topic uh, in coronary artery surgery the concept is always to have some cardiologists on board with us uh, to respect the concept of the heart meeting uh, that uh, we, we we really believe in and also to uh, learn something on a Saturday or a Sunday to be applied on a Monday morning. So uh, meetings that have a real clinical significance in a daily practice uh, of uh, all of us. Today, we have a fantastic set of panel. And uh, for this February edition, we have decided to dedicate it the uh, uh, event to coronary artery bypass grafting in women. We have yeah. had uh, the pleasure today to have uh, uh, Professor Vijay Kunadian, Kunadian, Professor of Interventional Cardiologist at Newcastle University, Dr. Isha Randiv, uh, Assistant Professor in Interventional Cardiologist at Mount Sinai Hospital, Dr. Jennifer, Professor Jennifer Lawton, uh, Professor of Cardiac Surgery at John Hopkins, uh, and Professor Brittany Zwiskenberger, Assistant Professor of Surgery at U University. We have also uh, uh, Dr. Rashmi from uh, Royal Brompton, and uh, we are here with Dr. David Taggart from Oxford and John Pascas from Mount Sinai, New York City. So uh, I give uh, the, the, the floor, the uh, baton, uh, the microphone uh, to uh, uh, Rashmi. And Rashmi, please uh, uh, give us a little bit of a, a understanding and an introduction of uh, the concept why coronary artery bypass grafting in women is such a relevant topic uh, and uh, what we, we are going to discuss in the next uh, hour. Please. Uh, Gianluca, thank, thank, you thank you very you. much. This is such a privilege uh, to be uh, part of this group. Um, and uh, Gianluca and I met uh, a few months ago at EAX and we had a very interesting discussion about coronary disease in women. Um, and I really, uh, in preparation for this talk, I looked at some of the previous uh, ISCA sessions that have been organized. And I have to say, this is an absolutely fantastic work. I'd like to congratulate Professor Taggart, Professor Puskas, and uh, Gianluca on this uh, really good uh, initiative. And I think that brings me to the topic that we are discussing today, which is about women in coronary disease and coronary artery bypass surgery and try and uh, unpack why this is uh, so pertinent and why we need to uh, talk about this uh, in a session uh, where we dedicate a whole session to this. And uh, my journey in this uh, investigation started, I'm, I've been a consultant for 11 years. I do a lot of coronary surgery um, and a lot of them are women and often from um, different ethnic backgrounds. Um, and my own observations about these patients uh, matched with the uh, clinical observations that women have different outcomes in coronary surgery. What was very striking for me was the Annals of Thoracic Surgery publication that showed um, in the, it was uh, 1.2 million patients in the U.S., who were looked at and analyzed, and we found that surgeons were more likely to deviate from CABG best practice in women, and 21%, uh, women were 21% less likely to receive a lemur to LAD when they left the operating theater, 14% less likely than men to receive complete revascularization, and 22% less likely to receive multiple arterial grafts. When I first saw these data, I really was, uh, very taken aback and um, needed to understand why this was happening. And of course, naturally, all of us who operate on women understand that women are likely to be older, smaller. The data show that they tend to be non-white compared to their male counterparts. They also get coronary disease a decade later, and they have more comorbidities of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, and congestive heart failure. 
Of course, there are socioeconomic factors, poorly controlled diabetes, anemia, and cultural biases that come into this. Um, now, this brings me on to technical challenges. Um, I think uh, perhaps at this point, um, I would like to stop for a second and bring in some of my co-speakers. Otherwise, it becomes a little bit of a monologue just from me. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Lawton and uh, Dr. Zwischenberger, perhaps uh, starting with Brittany. Uh, Brittany, can you tell us why uh, you think these differences exist? And I'm sure it is not for want of our will uh, to do the perfect operation for women. What is it that has given such a discrepancy between men and women uh, in coronary surgery? Right, yeah, so this is not data suggesting that surgeons are bad or yeah, ill-willed or not doing the best they can for every single patient. But um, as we discussed before we got going, you know, the, the patient's uh, coronaries, they're smaller, they're the uh, disease pattern. Um, the women are demonstrating less obstructive disease uh, probably different outflow. So, um, and then when we're assessing the graph, the lima is going to look a little bit smaller by your eye. Um, and so I think that it's this whole milieu and then certainly getting referred later sometimes with other comorbidities, um, which which adds to the complexity of the operation. So I think that the data that you just referenced about the descriptive data that we found from the surgeon uh, decision-making fits within this whole picture and really amplifies what the cardiologists have seen um, with difference, differences um, in results from uh, non-diagnostic imaging and then certainly on angiogram, which I would love to uh, hear our colleagues' perceptions from uh, the cath lab. Right, I'm just gonna try and share my screen. Are you able to see my screen, Gianluca? Perhaps you can help me with this. Can you see my yeah. screen? And uh, not yet. Today we are having some technical difficulties and I apologize to all of the people that are looking at us. This is to show you how real life uh, these, uh, <laughs> these events are. Uh, we operate up to Friday, you know, later on uh, we organize this one always uh, with, with, a, with, with a very tight margin. And for some reason uh, today the system is not allowing me to open uh, the, the camera of John Pascas so nor to share slides. Uh, I'll try, try, I'm trying to work on it and I will uh, get back to you very quickly if I can. But uh, I think we should proceed without. Uh, a, a yes, of course. Oh. This is a great test of our communication skills, right? <laughs> Being able to talk about the things that are on slides and not actually um, having them. I think that's fantastic. So, okay, I have one more attempt at sharing. Um, okay. I won't do that. Okay. Let's, let's keep talking about women and coronary disease. So, um, we've talked about the different physical features, the comorbidities, the socioeconomic factors. Now, what are the technical challenges? So this, of course, is a fact, and all of you in the audience will agree with me, women have smaller hearts. When you hold the heart of a woman at the time of surgery, significantly smaller than the heart of a man. And geographically, you look at the pictures, I often tell my residents, be careful, because the artery that looks very good size on a coronary angiogram on a woman's heart is going to be smaller. Women have smaller LADs, somewhere between 1.5 to 1.25 to 1.5 millimeters, compared to male LADs of two and a half to three millimeters. The disease is more diffuse and the coronary targets are smaller. Um, the next biggest challenge is the conduits. The lemur, the radial, the vein are all smaller in diameter and they are definitely more fragile. Um, and we often struggle to find what second arterial conduit to use. And I'm hoping that Professor Taggart will tell us about the findings of the ART trial. Uh, but essentially, you know, in obese diabetic patients, we would be very concerned about using a second arterial conduit with the risk of infection. At this point, perhaps I can bring Jennifer in to tell us about her extensive experience in operating on women. You've also written a review in circulation about this, Jennifer. What do you think are the reasons why women have worse outcome after coronary surgery? And can you share some of your experiences uh, about operating on women patients in the US, I can certainly tell you that, you know, there is a different, it's a completely different operation when I'm operating on a woman patient, and even more so when it's a woman from an ethnic minority like 
uh, let's say, Indian origin or uh, Bangladeshi or Pakistani. And I mean, they have to be talked about. There are differences. And you really need a delicate hand and a different level of uh, attention to detail to successfully deliver these women uh, through an operation. Thank you, Rashmi. Um, yeah, the, the reasons for the difference in outcomes is probably multifactorial and has to do with even before presentation with coronary artery disease, women tend to present later. There, there may be some inherent bias because the symptoms may be different. They're less likely to get referred for testing, including stress testing, cardiac cath, angiography. Um, and I, I would hate to think that surgeons are, are part of the problem, but I think we are. Um, and I, I also try not to think of women as different in size from men, because I think that will turn us off from using multiple arterial grafts. I try to approach every patient as if I'm going to do a bilateral mammary and a radial graft. And then I only remove one of those. If, for example, the BMI is high, the hemoglobin A1C is high, or there's a contraindication to a radial use. And I have operated on some very small men with very small coronaries. So I, I, I hate to say that women are always going to be smaller and to scare our trainees away from offering the same beneficial grafts to women. Um, I think if they there was so much more technical difficulty operating on a woman's coronaries, then they wouldn't fare the same as men with off-pump cabbage. I think they're a higher risk group and they probably benefit from off-pump if you're technically very good at off-pump. We know the time to construct an anastomosis in a man and a woman is the same. And we also know that younger women have a much higher mortality, as high as three times as high with cabbage. However, as we age, we appear more like men. And if you propensity match us with men, we're more like men when we're older. And those patients also, you know, we don't have an increase in our coronary size as we age. So there's there's more to it than the size. And I, I, I would encourage everyone to treat every patient um, as they're going to get multiple arterial grafting unless you find a reason why they can't. Thank you. I think I completely agree with that. And I think part of the purpose of this discussion is to highlight the problems, but also to uh, bring in the expertise of people like yourselves who clearly um, offered multiple arterial grafts to numerous women and to give us the tips and tricks that allow us to bring parity uh, in treatment between men and women. So I think that brings me on to um, some issues about um, the impact of, um, I've got some slides here that if I can share later on, I will share with you about the gender differences. Uh, but at this point, I'd like to bring uh, Vijay in to talk about cardiovascular disease in women. And there is a publication from The Lancet, and uh, Vijay is part of the authorship. Uh, it's the Lancet Women and Cardiovascular Disease Commission, Reducing the Global Burden by 2020, 2030. And uh, if you look at this publication, it's very stark. And it says, cardiovascular disease among women is understudied, under-recognized, under-diagnosed, under-treated, and women are underrepresented in clinical trials. So Vijay, take yes, it on uh, from here and tell us why this is the case and how we're going to change that and how we're going to make a difference. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rashmi. It's uh, really my honor to be part of this uh, fantastic discussion among distinguished panel. Uh, but when we actually come into discussing the, the Lancet uh, Commission of Women and Heart Disease, uh, I would say it is a little depressing. And recently I got interviewed on BBC Radio 4 uh, exactly on the same topic. And I use this word, we're really very backward in the management of uh, coronary artery disease uh, in women. So when you look at the statistics, we've just come out of the pandemic. Uh, it's not breast cancer, it's not cervical cancer, but it is coronary artery disease, ischemic heart disease, which is the number one killer uh, for women, uh, not only in the UK or US, but worldwide. But how many, I think uh, Dr. Lawton quite rightly pointed out, why are we having such worse outcomes in women, not just in surgery, but also with PCI? And I have done a number of analysis, uh, including uh, North of England database, as well as the entire UK database using our British Cardiovascular Intervention Society database, 
also collaborated with the Sweetheart. And it's a recurring theme that women, um, despite, and we might be putting the same stand, same treatment strategies, and they have worse outcome, both in hospital, one year and beyond. And, and this is something that clearly bothered us and that really uh, made it as a, as a, as a major uh, issue that Lancet commissioned this. And we looked into a number of uh, why is why is this uh, situation? And uh, as you pointed out, Rashmi, clearly we've been saying this for a number of years now, over decades, that women are understudied, under-recognized, under-diagnosed, and under-treated and under-represented in clinical trials. So it's a multifactorial uh, phenomenon that we must, now is the time to, to reverse that and address that because uh, heart disease, in particular coronary artery disease, is, uh, is preventable. So in terms of even before the patient comes to the cath lab for coronary angiography, and I see that to this very moment, that women, when they're having symptoms, they're not thinking that it is their heart. And I've had patients who've been treated for chest infection uh, or uh, given a treatment for indigestion, when in fact they are suffering from acute myocardial infarction. So even the recognition and awareness of the symptoms in patients coming to us, but of course, if they come to us delayed and we do an angiogram and they already have left ventricular dysfunction, if they have multivessel disease and we refer them to you for surgery, for example, somebody with multiple comorbidities, and as you pointed out earlier on, women have higher rates of diabetes, higher rates of untreated hypertension. If you look at the global burden, hypertension is something that we've known for a very long time, and that's been under-treated uh, globally. And all of these comorbidities, uh, again, uh, add to the uh, adverse outcome in women. But of course, when we look at the data from clinical trials, representation, both surgery, maybe in surgery is even less, 16 to 70% of the women represented in clinical trials are women in, in intervention, probably around 25 to uh, 30%. And there's also increase in uh, MI in uh, younger women, for example, that might be down to uh, increase awareness of this condition. And some of the things that we probably, as clinicians, of course, we are interventionally surgeons and we are focused on um, delivering the best possible um, uh, procedure. But women have a number of other factors, like pregnancy-related conditions can lead to, say, if they've experienced preeclampsia or gestational diabetes, they have worse outcome compared to when somebody don't have these uh, conditions. Menopause and other uh, endocrine gynecological conditions also lead to worse outcomes uh, in women. And the most important thing, observation that we saw, particularly looking at intervention, is that after we've done the procedure on these people, when they've been discharged, the medication prescription, these data again come from our uh, myocardial infarction national audit uh, project, MyNAP database, as well as from, from our American colleagues that women are consistently under-prescribed uh, with secondary preventive therapy. So we could be doing fantastic PCR, fantastic bypass operation, but if they don't receive the ongoing management of their atherosclerotic disease in the form of guideline recommended secondary preventive therapy, they are going to have uh, adverse outcome. And also the receipt of cardiac rehabilitation, uh, for example, again, we know that uh, cardiac rehabilitation leads to better outcomes and women receive consistently less um, cardiac rehabilitation uh, when compared to men. Um, and again, one of the things that we picked up is the socioeconomic status, and women are much more adversely affected, and these are uh, data and statistics coming from our own UK uh, ONS data, and we've published uh, some work on that. Women are much more adversely affected because of their socioeconomic status when compared to, to men, for example. So these are some of the uh, the uh, the aspects that might uh, attribute to worse outcomes uh, and as uh, clinicians um, uh, and researchers it's our responsibility now to enroll more women to understand uh, the basic pathophysiology and what treatment works better for women and i know there are some studies where exclusively recruiting women in surgical trials and we're doing trying to do the same in interventional uh, studies as well 
So yeah, I will pause you, there. And... Yeah, BJ, uh, I just wanted to make uh, one comment that um, to amplify what you said, but you know, the a lot of the diagnostic studies, randomized controlled trials, you know, Promise and the studies looking at CTA coronary, those have 50% women. And so, as you pointed out, the interventional studies and the surgical trials, um, you know, 16 to 20% women, that's a tangible drop off um, in enrollment, which, you know, the, the women are coming in with chest pain, but they're, you know, maybe uh, not the appropriate diagnostic, non, uh, non, you know, um, non-invasive diagnostic study is done. And we can see that they're getting picked up less. And then as you also pointed out, just this long spectrum of cardiovascular risk that the women have from you know the preeclampsia all the way to this. So I mean it seems like this is in 2023, we have all the pieces now. We have demonstrated the difference, the drop off at every single stage from the cardiovascular risk with preeclampsia and pregnancy to the different presentation, the diagnostic strategies and then the revascularization strategies and even the recovery strategies that yeah, we have the information and we're ready to move forward. I can't imagine anyone else putting a hole in this argument. Brittany, that's absolutely right. And I think the point is now that we know about it, I'm sure that things will change. And the, uh, you know, the finding out of the problem was one of the biggest challenges. Now that we know it's out there, I'm sure that things will be done to address those issues. At this point, I'd like to bring Isha in. Isha, you're an interventional cardiologist, and I know that, um, Dr. Roxana Mehran's work, amongst others, has shown us that actually similar problems to CABG also exist in PCI. So you've got smaller conduits, you've got smaller target vessels, women have more vascular problems, more bleeding absolutely. complications. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. In terms of technicalities of, you know, actually doing the PCI and the characteristics of women, it, it's very similar in terms of cabbage. I mean, smaller coronary arteries mean that it allows for only smaller diameter stents. And we know that with these smaller diameter stents, you have increased risk of restenosis of stent thrombosis. And the actual utility and benefit of them in the long term lowers in these patients. But I think also, you know, I think we under under signify the importance of diabetes in women and how that affects the vessels. And I think we're still just touching the surface of that. I don't think that we've completely understood it. And I think you see women with very diffuse disease. You don't have great targets. You have longer stents that need to be placed because there's significant areas of um, stenosis. And the, in general, these, whether it's a man or a woman, this would not, this decreases the efficacy of them. But in women, we just see that our targets are not as not as clear, with especially with the smaller arteries. Um, and I don't think that we've, I think it just comes right back to the fact that we don't have enough women in these trials, especially in our PCA trials, even 20% just isn't enough. And we're not seeing, we're not seeing that. Thank you. Gianluca, would you be, I see that you managed to get the slides on. So uh, let's use the crutch of slides. And uh, could you show us the next slide, please? We made it. Yes, indeed. Now, I put this x-ray up. I thought about this for quite a while. I thought, should I or should I not share this x-ray? Now, when you've got a short, obese uh, patient, the, uh, the care and attention starts right at the beginning. A midline sternotomy in women has to be done more carefully. The sternums are narrower. And, uh, you know, if you don't find the linear alba, and if you find the ribs on one side, then you do have to do the rubbish check wiring and the, the situation has to be controlled. So, you know, I'm, I'm not giving a message of uh, everything is terrible, but just that how much care and attention is needed and expertise is needed uh, to deliver these operations safely. Janluka, please, the next slide. And uh, this is an image of a 65 year old lady's heart and you can see the surface lacerations from rotating the heart to position it so again the strength of tissues can be different in different patients and perhaps this is not about men and women perhaps it is just about bo body size or frailty i would expect to see this in an octogenarian but sometimes i find particularly i do a lot of beating heart mitral valve repairs i have to say i find that the lv apex is more fragile the heart is more uh delicate uh in 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 these patients and this perhaps accounts for some of the uh, intraoperative challenges that we find uh next slide please um john luca and the 
we know about, we've talked about the diameter of the coronary arteries in the next one, please. So this is um, a slide of uh, mammary arteries. The top one is a mammary artery of a Caucasian male patient. The second one is a mammary artery of an Asian male. And this is the mammary artery of a young 38-year-old female patient. And I think this uh, highlights some of the res reservations that people might have in the operating theatre when they want to think about doing a Y graft. At this point, I'd like to bring in Professor Puskas. Uh, John, would you tell us about your BEMA strategy for women. And uh, the next slide, please, as well, uh, Gianluca, just to show another uh, set of uh, images taken some years later, actually, showing the same finding. This is a woman, Asian woman's lemur, and this is um, a Caucasian man's lemur. And these two, one of them belong to two different uh, ethnic uh, uh, subgroups, but male patients. And this is the lemur of a woman patient. So. John, tell us how you manage this. Do you find this? Is this something that is unique to my practice? Or do you also, have you seen this in your practice? And how would you train your residents to deal with such a small lemur? Um, and uh, I think it is more to do with height than to do with male and female. Uh, but yeah, please enlighten us. Share your experience with us. Thank you, Dr. Yadav. Um, I would agree that I mean, it's very clear we're not all the same human beings. We come in different sizes and shapes. Uh, and, and that means the arteries come in different sizes and shapes too. Uh, without a doubt, um, a four foot nine inch Bengali woman has a mammary artery that will be smaller uh, than a six foot four inch Caucasian uh, weightlifter. Uh, and, and I would I know I'm going to have an easier time teaching my resident with the weightlifting gentleman uh, than the diminutive Bengali uh, lady. Um, and in fact, I'm going to do the Bengali lady case. And Thank the you. Is going to do the other <laughs> um, yes. Because um, my gastric mucosa can't take it. Um, <laughs> it does require a more meticulous attention to detail. It demands really um, focus on every single minute maneuver of rotating an 8-0 needle through a very, very fragile tissue. It's like sewing wet toilet paper together sometimes. Absolutely. And you have to have it tolerate arterial pressure. That said, with very, very few exceptions, almost no exceptions, every patient in my practice gets double mammary grafts and a left radial graft. The most common reason to not have double mammary grafts and a left radial graft is that someone has repeatedly catheterized the left radial and the right radial. They're still going to get the double mammaries. <clears throat> the mammary arteries are harvested with the harmonic scalpel and meticulous attention to detail, which should produce and almost always does produce a usable bypass conduit. Um, we instill within it uh, using um, a very soft silestic uh, bulb tip needle a uh, cocktail of papaverin, lidocaine, heparinized blood, and plasmalite, and let it sit in there with a clip on the end, just as David described, um, beating against uh, blood pressure, um, and also bathe it within the uh, um, syringe of the same cocktail. Uh, so it may initially, after harvest, be really small. It may be a millimeter or a millimeter and a half. Uh, but after 20 minutes of this treatment, while you're getting set to do your distals or build the composite conduits, uh, it is doubled or tripled in size, um, and then it becomes a usable conduit. Um, in terms of building the conduits, uh, we do it with um, a very standardized meticulous technique. It's not uh, built on a moving target. Rather, the right inside your mammaries are brought up onto a towel uh, suspended between the edges of the uh, sternum, and it's an absolutely immobile a perfectly illuminated uh, platform in which to build the conduits, whether it's an I extension of one of the mammaries or a T or Y, um, a graft uh, side limb. Uh, and then once those are all built and they're done with heparin on board, uh, then we begin the distal anastomoses. Uh, my, my routine does not involve cardiopulmonary bypass nor proximal anastomoses. It's an all arterial, no aortic touch uh, default operation. Uh, with inflow from the two mammaries. So I am particularly sensitized to the concept of small mammary artery inflow because that's all I'm working with. Um, we, I mean, maybe one, less than 5% of patients are going to have any vein grafts. Um, 
or proximal anastomoses. In fact, the large majority of patients who have a vein graft, they have double mammaries and the vein is an extension or side limb from the mammary rather than from the aorta. Um, it, it is absolutely a more meticulous and demanding operation. I mean, just rotating an ADO needle imperfectly through a small mammary uh, can leave you an opportunity to redo that anastomosis. Um, and, and, and that obviously is not pleasant. Um, I was intrigued by your photograph, uh, Dr. Yadav, of the epicardial hematomas. Um, uh, because yeah. um, it's, a, it's, it's not a hematoma, it's a tear on the surface yeah. of the heart. Yeah. And, and this is um, very challenging. I can see some cardiopulmonary bypass tubing. So I gather this is an on pump operation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it is. Yeah. I have had, I have had epicardial hematomas occasionally uh, with off pump surgery and mm. uh, rotating the heart using the starfish or um, um, uh, the uh, the uh, McKay device um, for positioning. And so I've gone to using a combination of Paul Sargent's uh, gauze slings and mm -hmm. the starfish to minimize the amount of traction necessary on the epicardium. I, I also respected your photograph of the Robichek weave uh, <laughs> uh, for a variety of reasons. One, I think it demonstrates the transparency and, and intellectual honesty of you and of our organization. We're not proposing or uh, promulgating just our best outcomes. We want to show the reality here and help our colleagues around the world um, uh, do um, their best work for their patients. Um, the Robichek weave should be done proactively if one side of the sternum is uh, cracked or fractured. Um, and, and I think that while we very infrequently use the uh, titanium plates, they're also another very expensive alternative. Um, and and um, that, that can be of benefit and healing in a difficult situation. Um, I was intrigued at the comment um, Next slide. Mm -hmm. um, about um, older women being more like men and younger um, women, women having particularly worse outcomes um, with... Uh, presumably on pump coronary bypass surgery. Um, as Dr. Lawton commented, um, OPCAB seems to benefit women disproportionately to men and somewhat narrows the outcomes gap between men and women. Um, okay. Obviously women change their immunologic status and hormonal status over the course of their lives. Men do as well in different ways. Um, Jennifer, is there something, is there a matter of, you know, being further postmenopausal that uh, means a woman's interaction with the heart-lung machine is different than a woman's interaction um, prior to menopause or early after menopause? Um, is it a heart-lung machine thing or is it some other uh, physiologic uh, um, uh, issue that we don't understand well? Thank you, John. I, I think that the, the women tend to present about 10 years later with this disease than men and they tend to have more comorbidities so the the older women um sort of uh you know they they are more like men in that um it doesn't have anything to do with estrogen or postmenopausal status i think they're just higher risk from day one and have more comorbidities and then if you you know many studies have tried to propensity match men and women and they're just they can't match very many of the women with the men because they're very different um so the we, we also know that postmenopausal hormone replacement is actually not beneficial for women which for many years was thought to be beneficial um so i, I guess i'm not sure if i answered your question <laughs> well I, I i obviously there are a lot of unknowns here uh, one thing we do know is that we want to do the very, very best thing for every patient, irrespective of gender. And I appreciated Brittany's commentary that, you know, we're, it's not a matter of bad doctors or surgeons discriminating against women. It's a matter of practice driven by concern about outcomes um, and practice driven by the different comorbidities that individual patients bring to the operating room. That all said, um, uh, Dr. Canadian commented um, about a diminished rate of adherence to guidelines directed medical therapy among women prior to presenting for either PCI or cabbage. And I wonder if we could explore that a little more. I'm, I, I don't understand why that would be. Is it a matter of socioeconomic status, access 
or um, uh, you know, access to health care, uh, primary care, or is it a matter of you know prescription coverage, um, immigrant status? Um, I'm I'm confused why that would be. Why would there be a difference in uh, prescription of guidelines directed medical therapy for men and women? Yeah, that that really is a very important point, and I question that myself. Uh, why is this case? But I think prior to patients presenting to us, either in the setting of a chronic coronary syndrome or stable angina, or in the setting of acute coronary syndrome, the clinicians and the patients themselves do not think it could be their heart, because women traditionally um, correlate their symptoms to they're more um, um, uh, likely to seek help if they have a gynecological condition than think it's a heart, uh, it's their heart, for example. And I see that uh, in my practice, uh, where patients come several days after, uh, or they, I mean, it's, it's just a simple matter as putting their family first. I had a patient who was actually having an acute MI during Christmas time, and she did have some discomfort, and she said, and she came seven months after with ongoing angina, thankfully she was alive, but she had a CT of a right coronary artery with severely impaired LV dysfunction. And, uh, and I asked her, why didn't you seek help? And she said, I put my family first. I didn't want to bother anybody. So these are simple. To us, it's simple, but they are really contributing uh, to the delayed presentation of women, which is why in the commission, we mentioned that increasing the awareness, uh, not terrify, not terrify our population, but just increasing the awareness. If you're having these symptoms, uh, could this be my heart? Uh, and... Uh, and seek help uh, appropriately. But the question regarding why, after we've done PCI, after we've done cabbage, why are our patients still receiving uh, less um, secondary preventative therapy is, is really puzzling me. And I wouldn't discriminate between men and women uh, while giving them. But actually, I think some of the, um, uh, the uh, aspects, such as women, of course, do have uh, higher bleeding, and, and that is a fact, and we've published papers around that when compared to men, uh, women bleed more. So whether that might put people off, clinicians uh, uh, put uh, put them off of prescribing um, uh, a dual antiprepid therapy, for example, um, is is something, and that, that again, it has to be weighed on an individual basis than apply a blanket approach that I don't want to give a potent antiplatelet therapy to a woman, for example. And similarly, in our database, we have shown that uh, drugs like statins, uh, which of course is a guideline recommended care for coronary artery disease is underprescribed. And those are the areas that we really want to make sure that it's everybody's, whoever is looking after these patients with coronary artery disease, it's their responsibility to end, unless of course there's absolute contraindication for prescribing them. And that we, it's um, uh, it's important that uh, our female patients also receive um, the um, uh, the recommended uh, pharmacotherapy and uh, cardiac rehabilitation, for example. In fact, I wrote a paper that older people, 75 plus, and we compared the outcomes between men and women. And in in, in our study, because it was very controlled. Uh, both men and women received exactly the same treatment, both intervention as well as pharmacotherapy, and we didn't really see any uh, difference in their outcomes long term. So it could be as simple as making sure that after we've done our procedures, that our patients receive um, the the recommended therapy. And also, one of the differences is that we're learning a lot. There's more to learn, as as you pointed out. Uh, women have a lot more coronary microvascular dysfunction or microvascular angina. Of course, if I put a stent in, it affects, it It eliminates the, the, the obstruction in the epicardial vessel. So is coronary artery bypass surgery. And a lot of these patients can continue to have angina or, uh, or uh, symptoms or have worse outcomes because we haven't quite addressed the microvascular so it's questioning going beyond uh, what we see in the epicardial is so much important in the management of coronary artery disease in, in female patients. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot about um, just increased diligence for women, right? So not only are we, uh, do we need to study it more, uh, what are the differences, but um, can we be more diligent about what we already know 
and hearing, you know, the um, cardiac surgeons much more experienced than myself, it sounds like cabbage is not really a commodity for women. Um, you know, it's treated like that as a junior faculty. I know how we, you know, shuffle cabbage around. And, um, and especially in women, hearing each of y'all's description of how you approach women, um, it, it's just incredible focus um, on detail and techniques and multi-arterial grafting off pump, the role for that. And then, um, you know, minimally invasive cabbage, is there a role for that in women? And I think us looking in the cracks of our, of our, of our techniques to see, you know, we already know there's a difference in women um, clinically. How can we tailor our scientific questions to look into those cracks? Not just is off pump cabbage good or bad, but is it good for women in these situations, minimally invasive, same questions. Roshni, I think that's an excellent point. And Gianluca has been very gallantly um, helping us get the slides up and moderating and sort of, you know, putting everything together. Gianluca, I know you have a lot of expertise in minimally invasive coronary surgery and robotic surgery. Will you tell us a little bit about it? And I have a theory that actually women patients have it's easier to do minimally invasive coronary surgery in women patients because the heart is closer to the ribs and for some reason the rib spaces are wider. Is that your experience? Tell us. Tell it's, us about uh, minimally invasive you, surgery, Isaac. particularly in women patients. First, first of all, I, I want to say I, I'm enjoying a lot this session. Despite uh, the technical difficulties that uh, we were having today, I, I really love the discussion. I think it's it's bright, it's, it's brilliant. Uh, I, I, I do not recall uh, so, such a panel of, of people talking and I, I really enjoying uh, listening to all of you. Um, I, I love the concept of hybrid and minimal invasive coronary artery bypass grafting, particularly in women. And I, I, I want to engage also uh, um, Vijay and Isha here. Uh, I believe that there is a, an increased role for and an increased opportunity to treat in, with hybrid revascularization women meaning uh, I offer a minimal invasive single vessel Lima to LED without opening the chest, uh, without doing any spread, uh, uh, rib spreading technique, uh, or mm -hmm. I offer a bilateral mammary artery Lima to the LED and a Rita to the obtuse marginal or the biggest obtuse marginal of the lateral wall, again, robotically assisted without opening the chest and uh, with, so eliminating any risk of wound infection, eliminating any problem uh, with, uh, with uh, sternal uh, instability. And then I give back the patient to the interventional cardiologist that has two options. Uh, option A is to offer a complete revascularization by treating the remnants of the non-LED and uh, uh, non-OM uh, um, targets with a stent, or eventually, particularly in an older age patient population, uh, reassessing the concept of complete revascularization in the current era. Yeah. Do not go after any small uh, little vessels that might not have such an imperative uh, significance uh, in the current uh, in the current era. Maximize medical therapy and leave the patients with the two best arterial conduit for the two best uh, uh, coronary targets. Uh, uh, accomplish all of this without opening the chest. In our experience here in Mainline, we have done, uh, uh, thanks to Dr. Franz Satter, one of the lead leaders in minimal invasive coronary artery bypass grafting, more than 2,500 CABG since 2005, robotic CABG. And I recreate in the last year the entire database. And very interestingly, women perform the best. Women with hybrid perform the best and i believe that again is not all comers i still perform a lot of sternotomy i don't want to send the wrong message i still perform a lot of sternotomy capj multi-arterial in, in in women but i believe that particularly for an older patient's population uh, there is a role for hybrid or a very young patient population that comes to attention with very small uh, non-LED territories to perform uh, a robotic couch. And I personally love this option and I agree with you, Rashmi, there is technically it's easier to perform a robotic coronary bypass grafting uh, in a women uh, 
than in a man. There is only one limitation. I always calculate the distance of chest to spine, sternum to spine for the robotics. When I see that there is a diameter at the level of the pulmonary artery bifurcation less than 10 centimeter, I know that that robotic will be a little bit difficult because there's no much space in the chest and maneuvering my robotic instruments might be challenging. I just did this week an Asian woman, very tiny. She did beautifully, but it was technically more demanding, but again, feasible. So the theory of the conservation of energy for minimally invasive, it's never created or destroyed, just transferred from the patient to the surgeon. Yeah, <laughs> I know. My gastritis is really bad, I can tell you that. <laughs> On your birthday as well, Gianluca. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'd like to jump in and make a comment about uh, sternotomy. Um, first, uh, Gianluca is one of the most talented minimally invasive surgeons in the country, or, uh, and, and uh, so there are things that he can do uh, that many of us um, cannot do yet. Um, that said, um, sternotomy remains the standard way of operating on women and men. Um, given the concern about morbid obesity, cardiometabolic syndrome, high hemoglobin A1Cs, and sternal wound infection, I think it's very, very important to do, as Dr. Yadav said, make the sternotomy in the midline. I personally think we should make the skin incision long enough so that the edges of the skin are not grossly um, stretched during the whole procedure and subsequently ischemic and have difficulty healing. And I have become an absolute believer in vancomycin paste. Yeah. We take, you know, six grams of vancomycin powder and a few drops of plasmolite. And the scrub techs compete on who can make the best consistency of this uh, paste. And it should end up like um, almost like fiberglass uh, resin just before it finishes drying. You put on two pairs of gloves and drive that into the cut edge of the sternum on both sides um, after sternotomy, before beginning IMA harvest, and then again at the end of the case before closing. It does two important things. It, it actually helps achieve hemostasis from the bone marrow throughout the duration of an off-pump or on-pump case. And I believe it has an important impact uh, on a, as an antimicrobial. And knock on wood, um, we haven't had a deep sternal wound infection in about 500 consecutive double mammary cases, all comers. And I, I attribute it to those two simple things, sternum in the midline, a long enough skin incision that you're not grossly uh, stretching tissue, and vancomycin paste at the beginning and at the end of the operation. I will say, when I first began to do this some um, 10 years ago, I was very concerned about the vancomycin. <clears throat> what would the toxicity be? So I sent some serum levels, uh, vancomycin, from some patients. And then just for comparison, I sent samples of the chest tube drainage in the first few hours after surgery. I got a phone call from the director of the lab about the levels in the chest tube drainage because it was 2,000. As you know, 10 to 20 is therapeutic in the serum, and he didn't understand that that was blood from a chest drain, not from the patient. Um, but the levels in the patient were barely therapeutic. They were not toxic. So despite the large amount of it, it's not being systemically absorbed enough to produce a toxic effect. And it has at least temporally correlated with a near elimination of deep sternal wound infection. I think in women in particular, that's important. It may help us deny fewer women the benefit of double mammary grafting. John, that's so fabulous. I'm awesome. loving that we're sharing these, you're sharing these tips. And that's really, that's exactly what this talk is about. That's fabulous. And I think I'm going to liaise with Gianluca. And we're going to put a link at the bottom of this presentation later on with uh, the uh, concentrations, if with your permission, so that people can access and use it. The two important things I'd still like to address, and I know we're coming up to an hour, I'd like to bring David in. Uh, David, your teaching about 
how to increase the size of a lima, and I know John alluded to that already, has really helped me and stood me in good stead. And I also use your technique of pairing the radial. And perhaps you would tell us about that. And I would also, after that, like to go to Jennifer, because I know you have a lot of expertise. And we, I'd like to talk about the radial as a second conduit for women patients. And that is one situation where women do do better than men with a radial artery conduit. So David, please, uh, conduit preparation and your tips for uh, particularly for women and patients. Perhaps you can also enlighten us a little bit about the findings of the ART trial and the infection yeah, risk. Um, thank you very much. And congratulations to John and um, Jean Luca for organizing this meeting. And regrettably, I think we should have done this before. And I think we will need to do it again because it's raised so many very important issues. So, and, and thank you for your great commentary in outlining the background to where we are. And I have to say, I'm a bit embarrassed that I haven't really thought this through before. So I apologize for that. And also we haven't really looked in the art trial about the differences between men and women, but I promise you, we will do that. And again, I kind of, um, apologies we didn't do that for ourselves, but, but it's very, very good for you to highlight the importance of this. I think in terms of the talks we've heard today, they have raised, I mean, they've all been super, and especially your background introduction. And as I say again, to my embarrassment, um, I haven't thought these things through myself. I thought I knew everything about coronary surgery, but clearly I absolutely do not. Um, and in terms, so as I've said, in terms of the art trial, we haven't analysed women and men specifically. But one of the important, my absolute tips and tricks is so in my practice we do not discriminate between men and women of course. so we don't have a systematic objection to using bilateral ima in women unless they are obese and diabetic then we have a very big discrimination because we know that means problems in terms of the harvest of the mammary artery itself i absolutely believe the single most easiest way to deal with it is dissect it out from the chest wall, clip the distal end and raise the blood pressure to 150. And we publish this in Annals of Cardiothoracic Surgery because then it dilates that mammary, it will make it double the size. And the other major advantage is you don't have to give heparin. So it means you can then dissect the right internal mammary artery without worrying about it bleeding because you've already given heparin. So that is my single biggest tip for the use of the IMA. As I say, in our practice, we do not um, discriminate per chance by, by being a female patient unless you are obese and diabetic, and then we will only use a single mammary artery in that case. Thank you, David. Uh, Jennifer, would you like to tell us a little bit about the radial artery as a conduit, as a second conduit in women patients, and any particular tips pairing the radial artery so that it is optimized maximally? Absolutely. But I have to say, David, I love the fact that you say do not discriminate. And when we talk about multiple arterial grafts or, or any particular techniques with cabbage, you can't discriminate between anyone based on race, ethnicity, size, shape, color, or, or, or sex. So thank you for saying that. And thank you. To <laughs> and to highlight Brittany's work again, 1.2 million patients in the STS database, women are less likely to get a lima, a rima, a bilateral mammary, or um, all arterial grafting and to receive total arterial or complete revascularization. We know that women benefit from the use of arterial grafts. Many people have documented that, including radial artery, um, in retrospective analyses, women who get a radial do better than women who do not, um, although many biases in retrospective studies. Um, I treat the radial artery the same as I would in a man or a woman. Um, obviously, you have to have a radial that is um, a size that's appropriate and that doesn't have a lot of calcium. But most patients, if you do a good evaluation, and, and I don't use a radial that has been, that has a cardiac cath in the past, we've shown that um, they're, they're often occluded or they have dissections, and we have published pictures of that. Um, but a radial that has not been instrumented 
And then we tend to bathe it in a, a blood solution with papaverin, uh, make sure that it has no evidence of calcification or spasm. And I love putting the radial on the aorta. I use a smaller punch, smaller suture. I've also put it on the lima. You can combine it in many ways. You can sequence it. I love sequencing it um, on the lateral wall, say to an obtuse marginal or a diagonal. Um, and those are just a few tips. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, Brittany, would you share any of uh, your tips about um, how um, you would prepare your conduits and uh, anything particularly about um, this group of patients that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, so I wouldn't, I, I think that, uh, you know, those who've already spoken are much um, high, higher level of expertise for preparation. So I don't have anything to add to that. But I think um, a, an important finding from our study from, you know, Dr. Lawton was a co-author from the STS study was the reason for not using the Lima. And um, subclavian stenosis, for example, was double the reason that men were not, that women were not getting the Lima and um, educating the community about other options, you know, free Lima or um, subclavian stent is an option. So to me, that's that, that, that reason should not be an acceptable reason by the STS anymore. Um, and then as you mentioned, inadequate size or flow was um, more common in women that, that it wasn't being used. And, um, and having, as you mentioned earlier, driving up the pressure and trying to optimize the graft, a previous mediastinal radiation, certainly a history of breast cancer can skew people's perception perception of whether the graft will be good or not. So just harvesting the lima um, in a patient who's had more recent um, radiation, you know, breast cancer radiation, you know, it's probably usable um, in most cases. It's the kind of naughty old school uh, radiation that really kills the lima. And so I think that's a perception that we need to overcome that just because a woman has been radiated doesn't mean uh, that, you can, um, that you can skip the lima. Thank you. Uh, perhaps we can talk a little bit about the native vessel itself. So um, I'd like to ask the panel, when you see disease in the mid LAD, what do you do? And that is not specific to women patients. It is my practice for any patient when they've got multiple stenoses in the LAD, um, I would open the stenosis and I'd make a long anastomosis, a patch plasty with the lima to LAD, but I'd like to hear from the panel. Uh, about that. And uh, John, look, there are a couple of slides which we can share in a moment about sort of, you know, just an angiogram with the mid vessels. <laughs> Sorry, we've got. Uh, that's an interesting slide. The one before that, please. Before that. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, John, would you tell us if you have any specific uh, strategies when you. Yeah, there, there, there are three ways to deal with this issue multiple lesions in the LED. Um, pose a, a, a problem, but there are solutions for each of the scenarios. Um, the simplest solution is to bypass beyond the last lesion, uh, assuming that uh, there is enough residual uh, LAD that this is a productive endeavor. Um, a second simplest is to have the internal mammary touch down on the mid LAD as a side to side anastomosis, and then the same internal mammary go as an end to side anastomosis to the apical LED, a so-called skip graft. Mm -hmm. Another alternative would be to bypass a diagonal, which may be trapped between uh, lesions in the LED, and use that as a means of perfusing the mid portion of the LED and the septal perforators that derive from it, uh, while bypassing the more distal LED with the ITA. Um, the, the straddle graft, where you've opened the second lesion in the LED broadly and made a long onlay anastomosis, uh, a one and a half or two centimeter anastomosis, is another way of doing it. Um, I have done that. I had a mentor that did that routinely, uh, Ellis Jones, one of the mo most meticulous surgeons I've ever met, uh, the late, great Ellis Jones. Um, but I have tended to do the skip lesion rather than the straddle lesion approach, um, rather preferring to do uh, two grafts with one mammary artery on the LED as opposed to um, uh, ensure or believing with confidence that I can drive needles through calcified or cholesterol laden plaque and not have uh, a diminution okay. in mm -hmm. long term graft patency um, because of progression of disease there or thrombosis there. 
Uh, but all of those approaches have been used by many surgeons many times, and they all work, can work. Obviously, there's some scenarios where a skip graft can't work. If, if the proximal uh, portion of the LED is deeply into myocardial or buried beneath a very thick epicardial fat, skipping the, L, the LETA to there and then to the apex is going to produce a geometry that is not favorable. After all, grafts are like glider planes. They have to land gently. They're not helicopters. They can't come straight down. Um, especially if you're going to go on and do another graft beyond it. Um, so there, there are, those are the phrases I use for my residents. Uh, think glider plane, not helicopter. Indeed, uh, you know, so uh, there are different geometric situations where you've got to pick one over the other, but they are all valid and they all work. Fantastic. I think the other important thing to then, add is that- David, yes, please. You, um, my apologies, sorry. It, it was a bit of a delay, but I think the other important thing to add here is that the evidence is crystal clear in the literature that if you put an IMA or ITA on the LED, it will remodel the LED. Tom Lusher published this 30 years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. So placing an ITA graft to your LED is completely different from putting a vein graft on the LED. And I think that as long as you get a soft spot, so your anastomosis has to be absolutely correct. So look for the soft spot. But I think if you put an IMA or an ITA on the LED, it then has different pathophysiological consequences for that vessel. So if you look at a patient who comes back to you for a redo operation, you'll always see the same thing. The LED system is pristine, and wherever you put vein grafts, everything else is gone. So do not underestimate the potential of an ITA graft eluting nitric oxide and other beneficial vasodilators into the LED. Don't underestimate that. And if you ever do, as I say, just look at a previous redo angiogram and you always see the same thing. The LED is pristine and everything else is gone. Indeed, you're absolutely right. In fact, in my presentation, I had a very nice uh, image of a Lima Rima Y graph with pristine distal vessels. But I think we're coming up to just over an hour. Um, uh, there's one uh, point, one technical point in women when the Lima is small, uh, one mustn't be afraid to cut the Lima right back and find the LED at the most proximal points to make the anastomosis, even if that means chasing the LED into the fat or into the myocardium, but being very mindful of the length of the Lima, and the Lima really has to be in a straight line because when you're grafting the LED proximally, a long Lima can kink, and I had uh, one image that was uh, diagrammatically representing that. So if, if anybody has any comments about that, I often will, well, invariably will graft the LED as proximally as I can so I can get the biggest diameter of the lemur onto the LED, but that's probably stating the obvious here. <laughs> we all do that. There's another option that sometimes can be beneficial, and I, mm. I, a dear friend named David Taggart uh, emphasized this to me some years ago, that uh, if the, I, if the left, left ITA in situ is a little short for whatever reason to reach the LED target, right ITA can be disconnected from the chest wall, sutured um, as a T to the side of the left ITA, and the right ITA will now reach anywhere on the LED. Uh, and the left ITA can be used for a marginal or a ramus intermedius target, even if it's short. Um, and that's another way to get out of that bind. Fantastic. Um, okay, I think we've had a really healthy discussion and um, my takeaways from um, this fantastic discussion and a wonderful panel is that there are differences. Now that we know about it, we're all aware about it, everybody is making a concerted effort at every level, uh, right from uh, clinical trials to medical management to PCI to CABG to address these differences. There's no doubt that coronary surgery in women patients must be done with real technical skill, expertise, care, and attention to detail. And I hope that 
tips that the panel have shared today will be really helpful. Uh, and we will continue to treat women patients not as different to men patients, but just with that little bit extra care when you go into the operating room, aware of the pitfalls and with the determination to overcome them. Um, and I'd just like to hand over to John Luca, to David and John for really this absolutely fantastic opportunity to talk about these issues. And I, I have to say, I loved the sessions I've watched in the past. I hope that we've been able to match that to some degree today, but it really is a fabulous thing you're doing for coronary surgery and bringing this to the world. And I, I really congratulate you and particularly Jan Luca for bringing your energy, your enthusiasm, your humility uh, to the whole uh, program. I think it's absolutely wonderful. And it's a huge privilege having so many absolute experts in the field sharing their knowledge today. So I'd like to say, you know, looking forward to better care for everybody and also for specifically for our women patients. Thank you very much for me. Rashmi, you did a fantastic job moderating this session. I have to tell you, first, I enjoyed a lot for the first time to like listening and uh, like just working on the background of the technical aspects. I was very impressed when uh, I met you at the last European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery uh, meeting and you gave a fantastic presentation about CAPG in women. I think that your last comment and the way in which you're wrapping up is exactly on, on spot. Uh, do not discriminate, do not treat differently, but consider that women, and I'm sure that our colleagues, international cardiologists, has the same uh, opinions, uh, require that extra care. Coronary surgery in women uh, should be done uh, by expert uh, coronary art that's to particularly to deliver the highest quality, more multiple arterial, uh, 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 a perfect sternotomy, less wound infection. Uh, and all of this required that attention that you said comes from the hands of an expert, of a dedicated coronary person in, in the team of all of the cardiac surgeon centers around the world. So I want to thank you for your great contribution today and uh, thank you for moderating this session. I want to thank uh, everyone who participated here today. Uh, we have had uh, so many feedback uh, from, uh, from, from the audience uh, via the various uh, social media platform we are streaming from. All of this content will be available on the ISCAS website. We are recording all of this conversation and uh, uh, they will be available online on YouTube, but also on the website of ISCAS. We will add there all of the uh, um, papers that we have cited. We will uh, write down also someone had asked uh, how to use Vanco or how to create the Vanco paste that Dr. John Pascas was uh, was referring to. We will put the secret Italian recipe for the Vanco paste. And uh, I think that uh, this is an hour and seven minutes. I want to thank everyone for uh, dedicating this time uh, uh, on a Sunday morning and uh, looking forward uh, for, uh, for, uh, for more of this discussion. I ask you all of the panel to stay on uh, on here on, on online and I will close the live from uh, uh, ending the broadcast from our community. John, look at, can I just say quickly again, please, just to reiterate what you've said and a special thanks to you and John Puskis for thinking of this session. And in retrospect, we should have done it before and we will definitely do it again. So that's an absolute guarantee. Thank you to Rashmi for her absolutely super moderation. Thank you to the panelists who have made great contributions. And as someone who I personally before thought I was an, I, I was an expert in coronary surgery, I've learned a lot today. So I think the take home message is this has been a super, absolute super session. So thank you to you and John for organizing it. But we will definitely need to take a bit of a review of this session and say, how do we do this again? But we will absolutely, definitely do this again. Love it. Thank you. Thank you so much also to BJ and to Isha. Really, we love to have interventional cardiologists. We love the concept that is not a bunch of surgeons here. We work together. A lot of time these cases are challenging. We need to have open discussion with our colleagues, with our cardiologists. That's the only way to advance the field. No, thank you for this privilege. <laughs> It's been a, a delight working with Dr. Ranadiv at Mount Sinai Morningside. And I think that this panel embodies uh, a new generation of young women uh, 
participating in cardiovascular care uh, and embodying the heart team. Uh, it's a privilege to play a role. Fantastic. Thank I'm you. ending Beautiful. the broadcast now. Please, uh, everyone here stays online, stays here, and we'll... <laughs>